Hey, Clement, what do you have for us today? Uh, today, I'm going to talk about developer experience and how Quarkus make you as a developer really feel like a superhero and going in 30 minutes from really creating a project from scratch to deploying to OpenShift. Okay. Oh, let's see it. Uh, everybody's trying OpenShift today. So, uh, and uh, I'll share the links. Please join us on the workshops while Clement is presenting Quarkus. All right, so thank you for attending this session. My name is Clement. I'm working at Red Hat. I'm doing a lot of Quarkus, a lot of reactive things. But today, we are going to talk a little bit about reactive, but it's not really the topic of this talk. Today, I'm going to explain you how you can become a superhero. And it's all about developer experience. And Adrian Trenaman defined developer experience with this sentence. Developer experience is about reducing engineering frictions between an ID and getting it in production. And I love this definition because it's about removing all the small hurdle, all the small blocker you have that will slow down your progression. When you have an idea as a developer, you really, really want to see it in live. And that's what Quarkus uh, allow you to do. But first, what is Quarkus? Well, Quarkus is an open source stack to write Java application. It has been tailored for the cloud for microservices and serverless, but it's much more than this. Actually, Quarkus is a stack to build distributed systems because today, most of the applications we build are distributed systems. Call them microservices, monoliths, serverless, whatever, they are all distributed systems. Even games, mobile application, and most of the CLIs are distributed systems. So Quarkus provide a lot of things to build these distributed systems, going from REST to Kafka to event-driven architectures to monoliths to CDC if you want to handle data and so on. We are not going to see everything today, but we are going to have a peek to a few of these uh, domains. So Quarkus takes a very different approach to really build distributed systems the right way, building things for the cloud or for containers. The thing is, Java is not necessarily cloud native in the sense that the plain old Java style, you have your application, you do Maven package, and you get a file jar, a WAR file, a ERR file, and you deploy it. And then after it will start locating configuration file, passing them. It might be XML, so you need an XML parser. Then we will do uh, annotation uh, scanning, so class pass scanning. We are going to Look at all the classes you have in all those jars that you have embedded because they may have annotations. Uh, we are generally also doing some class loading check, like, oh, is this class there or not? And things like that, and enable disable feature for this. And then for each framework, we are building this configuration. And finally, we are going to do something interesting for you as a user. So starting the thread, starting the servers, thread pools, and so on. Quarkus is exactly the same, except that we do this before, at build time. At build time, we are going to read the documentation, the configuration. We are doing the class pass scanning at build time. We are going for each framework, building the model, the configuration, and we are going to infuse these inside the uh, artifacts, which means that when we start it, we have exactly the right set of instructions to start all your frameworks. As a result, we need a lot less time to start doing the right thing. So uh, threads, servers, and so on. But we also reduce the memory consumption. Why? Because all the classes that are only required for starting the applications are not embedded at runtime anymore. So with this, we decrease startup time, decrease memory consumption. We start becoming a lot more cloud native. But it's not only this. Quarkus can let you based on this can let you build a native executable. This is really a side effect of this build time idea. Because during this pipeline, we collect enough information about your applications so we can, well, tailor the native executable uh, to be really, really optimized. We're using GraalVM and the GraalVM compiler as any serious compilers need at least 25 arguments to get something right. But here in Quarkus, we make it very, very easy because we know everything about your application, dependencies, and so on. And we are going to tune this command line for having a really 
optimize native executable. We don't want fallbacks or uh, shortcuts who really want something optimized. Then you get even faster startup, even lower memory. But yeah, this is a, a, a blue wheel, but you may wonder about the pink wheel here because there is a second uh, ingredient in our secret sauce in, in Quarkus. And the second one is a reactive core. Remember, Quarkus is about distributed systems. And at the core of distributed systems, there is IOs, right? And we need to handle these IOs the right way in an efficient manner, or, well, all your systems won't be, won't fly, won't scale, will have plenty of failures and things like that. So bad user experience at the end. So Quarkus is based on a reactive core and then a set of extension and finally your application core. So what's wrong with a traditional model? So traditional model associates request to worker thread, which means that it limits the concurrency by the number of worker thread you have. So by limiting the concurrency, I mean the number of requests you can handle at the same time. So if your, your system is fine and not very popular, okay, cool. But as soon as you start being popular, this model well, doesn't fly anymore. And the fact is because it's used uh, blocking IO, your threads are going to be blocked at some times. So you are paying a memory cost, a CPU cost, and not making any progress. The reactive execution model is different in the sense that a few IO threads, often called event loop, can handle multiple concurrent requests. But the model is totally different, where we start handling a request, and as soon as it needs to do an IO, instead of blocking, it will schedule the IO and release the thread. So the thread can be used to handle a second request. Once the scheduled IO completes, then we can continue the first request on the same thread and make progress until we need to schedule a second IO, another IO, and so on. So yes, it's more efficient, but man, it's kind of more complicated too, right? Because you need to divide your program in a chunk of, of things like this. So it's exactly this. Reactive comes with a different concurrency model where because of this, your application code can be called on the IO thread. Very, very efficient, very, very concurrent, but you need a bottle of form because that makes the world thing complicated. And it's not, should not be an obligation. You should have the choice as a developer to decide which part of your application is reactive, which part is imperative, and mix that depending on your skills and the needs. And that's exactly what Quarkus is doing for you. Quarkus has a smart routing and detect for you without you having to say anything, whether your method, your uh, applications is a reactive one and can be called on the IO thread because it's not going to block, it release the thread and so on. Or if it's a blocking one, and in that case, switch to a worker thread pool. So it really unifies reactive and imperative and you can mix them together in the same application. We are going to see that. And you will, you will see it's just, for you as a developer, just works. No problem. So again, let's go back and talk about frictionless development. And there is no better way to demonstrate frictionless development with Quarkus as doing it. So we are going to create a product from scratch, do some REST API, database access, do some testing, integrate some remote service uh, that uh, exists. So it's uh, the movie database. Um, using some fault tolerance features because calling a remote service means I need to pro protect myself against failures and deploy this to Kubernetes, and in my case, OpenShift. All right, let's have a look at this. So the first thing I will do is to go to this website, so code.quarkus.io. I already pre-configured my, my system here. So we are going to create an application called the Movies. We are going to uh, manage Movies. Um, and I already selected 10 extensions to do REST, uh, data handling, validation, and a few more things that we will see along, along the, the journey. So I generate my zip, I download it, it's there, I unzip it, all right, should be unzip it in my download directory, so let me check. Yes, the movie, okay, I'm going to uh, just copy two files, one which, oops, um, okay, let me check, ooh, let me check why it didn't uh, unzip it. Aha! Okay, so movie two. We, oops, two. Yes, now it's working. So 
Uh, so I'm just copying some HTML front end and some config. We are going to see that. I'm going to open my IDE immediately. And yes, I trust this project. I just generated it. Here we go. That's my project. And while it's indexing, thank you, IntelliJ, for indexing everything. I'm going to start my application in dev mode. In dev mode, Quarkus is going to follow my, well, my change I do in my code, in my resources, and so on. And as soon as I need it, we'll recompile and restart my application. So I have always something uh, up to date so I can try it immediately. So it's starting right now. Uh, yep. So what you can see here is that you see some Docker stuff here. Actually, because of the set of extension I've picked, you realize that I may need a database. And I don't have one running. So what it is doing, say, OK, you need a database. Let me start one for you and configure your application for you. So right now, I already have a database plugged to my application. I will have used Kafka. It will have started Kafka automatically. So let's go back to my browser and see if my application is running. Yes, that's the landing page. And I have an hello uh, message or hello REST is directive, which is a REST framework I'm using. So let's go back here and see where from does it come from? That come from this file here. And if I say DevNation, because that's where we are today, I go back to my browser and I refresh and boom, already DevNation. So you see it, I don't have to restart on anything. It's just doing it for me. So another cool thing is testing because well, when you do application like this, you need to test them. So in my dev mode, I just press R and it's going to start the test and continuously do them. So right now it's looking at the test and running them from the dev mode um, using a second instance, a test instance of my application and boom, it fails. Why? Because it was expecting REST is reactive. So we're going to do something that every developer is doing instead of fixing the bug, let's fix the test. So like this, I go back here, I don't have to touch anything, and boom, it sees the, the test changed and recompile it automatically and rerun it, and now I'm good to go. My test is passing, let's start my REST API. So my REST API is going to handle movie. So movie is what I'm going to persist in my database. So I'm, it's an entity, and we do that with style, so it's a panache entity. And panache makes things a lot easier. So a movie has a title and see it's a public field it has a cover okay and it has a rating which is my personal rating let's say that the title is unique okay and not blank well we never see a movie with a blank title right and the rating go from one very bad to five movies i love we're done for this so we already have this um, and now I'm going to uh, do the rest endpoint on, in front of that uh, movie, movie resource, movies resource. Okay, so that will uh, be listening on slash movies. But using the system I was using before, um, uh, so continuous testing will be great is to have some tests already done so I can do some kind of TDD kind of things. That's what I'm going to do right now. I will create a test. Yes, okay. And uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, copy some code. Oops. That just do this. Yeah, so a few tests about my API, which uh, introduced two movies, Rombo and the Pianist and check that we can edit them, add them, delete them, and so on, and doing some uh, validation test. So if I go back to my dev mode here, you see that it's already executing this test and they are failing. Why? We forgot to implement the REST API. So let's do this and start with the get method. Uh, so the get method will get all my movies. Okay, and here panache is very, very useful because you can just do return movie.list all and done. So let's see. Ah, it's still failing. Hmm, okay, so maybe I should have a look at what's going on actually in does that work or is that a test problem? So I can go to q slash dev to the dev console. 
So Dev Console is your toolbox with Quarkus. It's always running when you are in Dev mode, and you can go here, go to Swagger UI, and see you what you have developed. Go to Get Movie, try it out, and see if it's working. Oh uh, yeah, but it's empty. Oh, it would be great to have some existing movie in my database. So let's do this. I will go back here. I will create a new import.sql file, which in dev mode uh, will uh, provide uh, some different movie matrix towers and so on. So now if I go back here and I do execute, I should get my movie. So the get works. So maybe the tests are failing because I didn't do the insertion one. So let's do this. We need to have a way to add a new movie post. Um, movie, add one. And I want some validation here. So I want uh, to receive a valid movie. And valid is what is going to check uh, the constraint I have added on my movie uh, classes, so the not blank, uh, unique, uh, and rating, and things like that. And again, uh, Panache makes that very, very easy because I just have to do movie.persist. If it's not valid, it will return immediately. And I would just return the movie. That's it. So now let's go back here, and it's going to run the test. Oh, it's not passing. Oh, yeah. Forgot there is a bug here. You need a transaction. Again, let's check. And of course, you can toggle the output of the test by clicking, uh, by uh, hitting O, and you will have all the output of the test. If you need that, uh, I can hide it, and we run the test directly from my browser, and you see three tests are passing. So we are good here. So um, let's have a look to our very nice UI I have done. So it's not nice, but we need a UI. So this is my HTML page I've copied uh, before. That's the movies we have introduced. So, oh, look at that. This is off. Four, five, five, two. Mm. I want something sorted. Go back here, there, and I want my list to be sorted by descending rating. Go back here, refresh, and that's sorted. Again, you see in the flow, you can edit your HTML or the, the data directly. That's just fine. Um, and let's check something. I want to add a new movie. And let's, uh, I loved Inception, uh, so let's add it. OK, so I did at the right place. OK, cool, but oh, there is no cover. Ah, yeah, and I don't have the cover for that. So what we are going to do now is to use a remote service, uh, the movie database, uh, to get the cover. So let's see how we are going to introduce this new service. So I'm going to create an interface, which is the movie database. I'm going to use the REST client. So the REST client is a way to, um, to describe your HTTP interaction using annotation. The same set of annotation as you use for the server side, you use it for the client side. So it starts with register REST client, saying this is a REST client. And then you can add all the operations you want to use from this remote service. Today, we need only one, the search one, which is a get on slasher slash movie, where you pass a key. The weird thing of this service, you pass a key as a query parameter, but whatever, and the query, uh, which in our case, just a title. Once you have this, you need to do a bit of configuration, which are these two lines you have here. The first one defines the URL, and the second one that I need to copy is just the root uh, of our covers, because the response contains a relative path according to this, well, relative to this path. So now that I have this, which is very simple because look, it's really, uh, sorry, it's really the, the same set of annotation, a bit of mapping, that's it. I can come back here and say, okay, I want uh, my REST client first, uh, which is the movie database, but my service, okay, that's my remote service. I want some config property, uh, this one, which is my, root for my cover, and I need the API key. And as you may have seen, the API key is not in my application uh, properties because that's a secret. I don't want to reveal that to you. So um, it's um, our mechanism is uh, can combine multiple config source. And right now, it's an environment variable. And we will see in Kubernetes, it's a, uh, a Kubernetes secret. But for you, that doesn't change anything. So now that I have this, let's do a method name enrich, which take a movie. 
and we'll uh, search for that movie on this server, on, on this service, so movie.python. OK. This returns a list of results. And I need to find, because it's a fuzzy search, so I need to um, do some uh, 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 filtering. So let's say I want all the movies that, well, the title match uh, my, uh, uh, my movie. OK. And uh, find any. Okay, this is going to be my response. And if uh, response, if present, I found the movie, then I'm going to um, uh, update my movie with the right cover. So root plus uh, poster. That's all we named it. And I'm going also to update the title to get the right capitalization because it always makes me uh, crazy when the capitalization is, is wrong. And that's it. I just have to call this method here. And done. So now when I'm adding a movie, it's going to uh, go on the, the movie database, search for it, find it, extract the cover, fix the capitalization, and save it to my database. Let's try that. Oops, wrong one here. So let's refresh. So inception will disappear because every time it will uh, drop and recreate my database with my uh, initial state. Inception, inception, was of the right capitalization, rating five, and now it's there, right capitalization with a cover. That's it. So uh, let's add another one, Rambo. Uh, Rumbo, yeah, kind of three, right? Didn't edge well. And boom, I got Rumbo rating three and so on. So we are using a remote service. So every time you, when you use a remote service, you need to protect yourself. Um, here, I'm just going to use fault tolerance annotation. I want a timeout because I don't want to wait more than uh, um, um, one second. Oops, unit for a second. I hate waiting. Um, well, let's say that if it doesn't work, then I want to retry. And um, max retry, let's say, twice. And between every retry, let's wait for uh, two seconds. Something like that. You can also use a circuit breaker or a fallback or even um, um, a bulkhead if you want to avoid uh, a, Dido seeing your, your service. So you have plenty of options. It's very easy. You just configure it. And then you can say, hey, these, are, these values are hard coded. Everything I've write in those annotations can be overridden from the application properties or from any of the config source we support. Um, uh, system property, uh, and variable, uh, um, Kubernetes secrets, or config maps, and so on. Um, so my system is now working. So let's go back here. All tests are passing. Great. I don't have to rerun them because it continuously runs them. So I'm very happy with this. Uh, I got my complete system. So, well, time to deploy it on Open on OpenShift. I go back here. I will go to do slash dev. Here I select OpenShift, click deployed, and click deployed. So what's happening behind the scene is that it's going to connect to this OpenShift that is running here. It's again as a so OpenShift sandbox, so you can use it with OpenShift sandbox. I already started my Postgre database. I already have my secrets for uh, the API key, so TMDB, and it's going because it's OpenShift. It's going to build it, so send uh, the fast draw and build it there. And while it's doing so, I'm going to show you a few more things. So. The first thing is, how does this uh, uh, Kubernetes deploy work? So the thing is, you will need to say how you configure your prod system. And in prod profile, this is a prod profile, uh, we want to uh, use the Kubernetes config, so the Kubernetes config source, uh, to read two secrets, Postgre and TMDB. Uh, Postgre is going to give me the database users, database password, and so on. And that's it. I just configure this and it will get the right username password that is stored on on uh, on, uh, on OpenShift. Same thing for TMDB. It will add the right uh, API keys that we add, so uh, the movie database dot API keys, because that's how the secrets has been structured. OK, let's go back uh, to my dev console. Oops. What happening? 
Okay, so we will see if it's working or not. Uh, sometimes it's just nothing, but um, quickly look at this. If the move, yes, the movies. Uh, did we have a build? The build task is completed. And yeah, but it didn't work. So let me retry pretty quickly. Deployed. Anyway, and while it's doing so, I want to show you a few things. So remember the two principles of Quarkus. First, build time. And we push this ID for every extension we have, but actually Arc, uh, our dependency injection framework, make it very, very nicely, well, can explain it. So Arc at build time found all the bins you have in your class pass. And it found 91 bins, because obviously there is a bins of my application, but everything that we provide. On this 91 bins, it found out that 65 of them are not used. So it just dropped them, simply. So all these bins that I have here, are not used in my application. So they are not even declared in my application or run in my application. It drops them at build time. Um, the second thing is a reactive core. So I'm using REST is reactive, uh, but see, all my code is purely imperative. So it's not because there is reactive in the name, it's just because it uses reactive core of Quarkus. And you can get the endpoint score. And all my endpoints I have right now don't have a great score because I use a worker thread. So I can update this hello here, which is here, and say, well, OK, you have detected that this method can't be called on the uh, IO thread, but actually it's wrong. So you can do it. So I just had to add non-blocking or return a completion stage or a uni if you, if you want to do that. And then go back here, do a refresh oops, here. And now we have the 101 on 101 score for my reactiveness of this because, well, it use the right writer, it dispatch on the IO thread, and yeah, it's it use an um, application scope thing. So that works very well. For the others, I can't do that because they use a database. And if you do that, you will have a error message because you can't block the IO thread. So, Let's go back to uh, my OpenShift. Oh, yes, so now it's, it has worked. So, sorry, probably some network glitch. So, uh, this is my application. It's connected to my uh, Postgre database. It's running. Uh, and when I say running, it also have health checks automatically. Because I have the else extension, it has a health check for the database and every other extension. So, let's have a look. Is it working? This is my landing page. I should have removed it, slash movies.html. Yeah, this is my page. And let's have a look. Inception, still great movie. OK. Inception, rating. Uh, let's have Rambo. And boom, that's just working. My system is now working on OpenShift. Um, so let's go back to the slide and conclude this. So that was the demo. OK, great. Um, so let's go back to see what we have seen. We have seen a project creation from scratch, REST API, database access with Spanish, continuous testing, remote service integration, fault tolerance annotation, and deploy to Kubernetes slash OpenShift. And this in 20 minutes. If you want the code, it's there, uh, so you can just fork it and, and use it. Uh, you will need to have a, a credential for the movie database, but it's free. Um, so again, dev services. I didn't start a database on my system. I have no database on my system. It started for, for me, for it for me in dev mode and, and test mode. And yeah, I don't have to do anything. It just configure everything. When you use things that can be shared, like Kafka or brokers and things like that, it will share between application running in dev mode on your systems. It makes onboarding very, very simple. Panache, you access your data with style. It supports active records, what I use, but also the repository pattern. More from if you come from the Spring world, that's probably what you are familiar with. It supports both imperative and reactive. Again, it unified both. Continuous testing. Well, testing should not be an extra step. You should not go back to your ID, right click, run test, and so on. Here, it just run it continuously and report it. Hey, you are debugging something? OK, but you broke something. So maybe when you are done fixing your bug, maybe you should have a look at this. So before doing a 
Git commit, git push, check your test. It's there, it's running for you, so you don't have to do anything. Um, it's not intrusive. You see, you can uh, decide uh, uh, if you want to run them or not, if you want the output or not. You can also run them from the dev console. And it automatically detects the test to run. So when you modify a test, when you modify a resource, it will find which uh, method is called or which test need to be run. Dev console, all your toolbox, all your tools in a single place. No need to install Kafka Cat, uh, a specific Swagger UI, or Kafka UI, or some uh, gRPC curl thing, or a GraphQL viewer. No, we provide everything for you. So want to check your, your, your REST endpoint, you go there, you click on Swagger. You have a, G a gRPC service, go there, you can invoke it to see if it's doing the right thing. Want to know what's happening in Kafka? You can go uh, and see that. So the Kafka UI is going to be delivered in the next version, it's not in the version I use today. Same thing for data sources and so on. Finally, YAML NetS. Well, actually Kubernetes, but was it YAML? Um, it's integrated automatically. You can configure everything, secrets and the deployment, base image, and so on. But automatically, it gets health, metrics, service bindings, and so on. And you just have to click on a button. If you are using Kubernetes and not OpenShift, it will build the containers for you, push it to uh, the configured uh, um, image registry, and uh, deploy or restart your deployment for you. There is also a, a remote dev mode where instead of having the application running locally, you can connect to a running pod and it will restart the application in dev mode and all the change you do will be reflected on, uh, on your inside your pod automatically. Uh, obviously, you need some authentication mechanism to avoid everybody to do everything. And don't use this in production, but that's very, very useful when you want to debug something that's only happening in OpenShift or in Kubernetes. That's just a scratch. Uh, Quarkus ecosystem is huge. And we have seen a little bit of CRUD, a little bit of cloud, but Quarkus can do a lot more than this. You can build monoliths, event-driven application, reactive systems, microservices, functions, command lines, admin, uh, administration tools such as Cube, uh, Cube operators and so on. It's all based on two simple ideas. Build time first, reactive core to handle the IO the right way. Then on top of that, we have an awesome frictionless developer experience where you're never blocked. You always make progress and you go from an ID to your Kubernetes in 20 minutes. If you want to go further, I recommend these two books. The first one from Eric um, that you can download for free from Red Hat Developer. Uh, if you are a Spring developer, it's it's great because yeah, it will talk with the same lingo that you used to have in in, in Spring. The second one uh, it's a little bit more advanced. Uh, uh, it's going to be published in November. Uh, it's Reactive System in Java uh, that I've finished to write with my friend Ken. Um, it's how to build distributed systems the right way with Quarkus uh, using, well, what we've seen today, but also Kafka, IMQP, and a lot more things, observability, and so on. If you don't know what to ask for, for Christmas, that would be a perfect gift. And sorry for the shameless plug. That's it. Thank you. And I don't know if we have any time for questions, but um, anyway, you can go to Quarkus.io or code.quarkus.io and start developing and filling the, well, the great developer experience we have, and having all the benefit of Quarkus, uh, temperament density, reactive and imperative side by side. So you can really do what, yeah, the next modern application you build. You, uh, you want to uh, discuss with the team, you go to Zilip and you can uh, discuss with the team or follow us on Twitter. And that's all I have. Yeah, thank you, Clement.